We are up to chapter 1, Mishnah 11, and we're going to do Mishnah 11 very quickly in Mishnah 12. We're going to spend a lot of time in Mishnah 12. Chapter 1 is going to be all the leaders of the nation. So every one of the great sages that's been mentioned so far is the leader of the nation. So we start off the Men of Great Assembly, and then we had Shimon Atzadik, and then Antidnos, and then we had five sets of Zugos. Today we're going to get to the last set of the Zugos, is Hill and Shammai. Zugos are the times in history, about 200 years, where the leadership was split between the Nasi, the president, and the Afbezin, the head of the court. Uh, from this point onwards, the leaders of the people are going to be the, just the Nasi, who is going to be the descendants of, of Hillel. Hillel is going to be the last Nasi who is part of a, of a tag team. From then on, it's going to be his descendants are going to be the family of the, of the Nasi going forward for the next 400 years or so. Uh, but the first chapter, uh, what's noteworthy, the progression that we're going through here is the leadership of the people from generation to generation and what those leaders said and the teachings that, that they enshrined for eternity. So the first one is Avtalion. Uh, Avtalion Omer, Avtalion says he's the second half of Shammai and Avtalion. And they're, again, like we said last week, we don't know so much about them. Their, their students, Hillel and Shammai, are going to be much more famous, and we have a lot more stories to tell about them. So what did Avtalion say? Chachamim, scholars, hizaharu bidvreichem, be cautious with your words. So again, maybe this is the reason why we're not going to elaborate so much. He's talking to scholars, he's not talking to us. We're just simpletons. Be careful with your words. Why? Shema tachovu chovaz galos, perhaps you will incur the penalty of exile. And you'll be banished to a place of evil waters, which probably means heresy, according to most commentaries. And drink from them will the disciples who follow you there, and they'll die. So what he's essentially telling us, be very careful what you say. Now what this means, all the commentaries give a little bit of a different angle to it. So Rashi, for example, tells us, don't teach something which is imprecise. Try to be very precise in the wording that you use. Uh, the Rambam says something really interesting. He says, don't teach with ambiguities. Sometimes the teaching itself is best conveyed with a little bit of subtlety. But if there's a heavy ambiguity that could be misinterpreted, it could lead your students down to the path of the evil waters of heresy. And he gives an example, all the way back to the, I think it was the third Mishnah, we had Antignus. Antignus taught this very delicate, very, very sharp teaching, but it, was, it, was, it could be misinterpreted, where he says, don't be like servants who serve God with intention of receiving reward. Do it with intention of not receiving reward, or not with intention of receiving reward. And that sent two of his students awry. Because he one of his students, of course, was Tzadok, who was the founder of the Tzadokim, known as the Sadducees, right? Tzadok became the founder of the Tzadokim, the Sadducees. And the other one became the Baitus, the founder of the Baitusim. But these were essentially splinter groups amongst the nation who rejected core tenets of Jewish faith. Because they said, oh, nothing matters because there's no reward and punishment. That's what our teacher said. But he didn't really say that. And he, he was teaching a very subtle lesson. But the Rambam says, and the Rambam says this elsewhere as well, that this teaching comes several hundred years later from Avtalion, and he is criticizing the predecessor that came 200 years prior. Because now this student that went awry, that drank from the evil waters, is now founded a whole movement at the time that Aftalian is talking about, at the time he, that he's living, it's under the Hasmonean rule. Hasmonean rule is the family of the Maccabees, and they became, they started a dynasty, and they had sovereignty over Israel, but many of their kings became Sadducees. And the Sadducees became a very formidable force, and what they were never, they were never the majority in the nation, but they were a very formidable force amongst the nation and it caused all kinds of problems for the rest of the Jewish nation. And here, the great scholar is looking back to where this all got started because there was a little bit of an ambiguity in a very powerful and very deep teaching. He should have made it very, very clear from the onset uh, what he meant and what he didn't mean. And therefore, the Ram is saying is that he's like, he's, he's, not, he's criticizing, even though not mentioning his name directly, he's not denigrating him. He's not castigating him. But he's saying, Chachamim, righteous people, if you are a scholar, if you have a position of leadership amongst the nation, you have to be very wary with your words. Be careful with your words because if you teach something that 
is ambiguous and can be misinterpreted in a heretical way, and you can't control necessarily where your word is going, it's quite likely that one of your students will take it with the unintended interpretation of your words and will go awry. So be very careful. Uh, other commentaries say is that be careful with your words. Don't be sanctimonious. Practice what you preach. Don't be hypocritical. Be careful with your words because whatever you preach, make sure that you yourself are worthy of, the, of that teaching. And I know the Muslim masters will be very, very careful about this. They would never teach something, preach something to their students unless they themselves were of that stature. They wouldn't say to their students, I can do this and this and this unless they themselves have done it. And that was something which was uh, across the board ubiquitous amongst the Muslim masters. So that's an example of this idea to be very careful with your words. But of course, we're not great scholars. We're going to move on to the next Mishnah, a very fascinating Mishnah of Hillel and Shammai. So Mishnah 12. Hillel and Shammai. Kiblu Mehem. They receive the tradition from them. So this is the, f- the fifth and final pair of Zugos, the twin leaders of the nation, Hillel and Shammai. Hillel Omer, what does Hillel say? Have me talmid of Shal Aharon. Be among the disciples of Aaron. What was that? What, what does that mean? Ohev Shalom, Verodev Shalom, someone who loves peace, someone who is pursuing peace. Ohev Esabrias, someone who loves people, Umekarvan La Torah, bring them closer to Torah. So this is going to be the first of three consecutive teachings of Hillel. This is the first time we see in chapters of the Fathers a great rabbi teaching more than one teaching. He's going to have three in a row, Hillel. And, uh, and then we're going to have one teaching from Shammai as well. But Hillel is one of the great legendary figures of Jewish history. I decided to, what, did I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to split some of my biographical notes on Hillel. Uh, some will do this week and some will do next week. Because there's a lot. In fact, if you're interested, I did give a whole lecture on Hillel and his story. That can be found on the Jewish History Podcast. So if you want to listen to that, you can go check it out. So, first of all, just as an introduction, the Talmud tells us that there's four people who lived to 120. Moshe, Hillel, Rabbi Yochum and Zakkai, and Rabbi Akiva. Both of them will watch the meeting per Kavos. It's not just listing an arbitrary, that, oh, they happen to die at the same age. It means that they had a role very similar in their leadership of the nation, in stewarding the nation through very difficult times. Moshe, of course, is the greatest paramount leader that we've ever had, but then it puts on the same pedestal Hillel, Rabbi Yochum and Zakkai, and Rabbi Akiva. And it actually goes on to compare Moshe to, to Hillel by saying that Moshe, he was in Egypt for 40 years, he was in Midian for 40 years, and he was the leader of the Jewish people for 40 years. Moshe, of course, he arrives at the helm of leadership at the age of 80. Similarly, Hillel, he lived in Babylon until he was 40, and then he studied for 40 years under Shemayin of Talion, under his teachers, and he led the people for 40 years, like Moshe, from 80 to 120. Uh, he lived a very long life. The years that we have for Hillel is from 110 before the Common Era to 10 of the Common Era. So he lived for the duration of the first century before the Common Era, a very chaotic century for the Jewish nation. And he arrived to Israel. He's, he's from Babylon. He's called Hillel the Elder sometimes. Sometimes he's called just Hillel. There's, there's another Hillel who arrives, who's his great descendants, who arrives in the fourth century. But he's called either Hillel or Hillel the Elder. You would imagine if we lived 120 years, maybe we could all get that moniker as well, uh, the elder. Or Hillel Habavli, Hillel from Babylon, because that's where he was from. At the time, there's uh, Jews living in Israel, of course, uh, but there's many, many Jews who are still in Babylon. They've been there ever since the first temple was destroyed. All the Jews moved to Babylon. Some Jews came back, but many Jews stayed there. And for the whole second temple era, there's two concurrent Jewish centers, one in Israel and Babylon. There's Jews living elsewhere as well, but the two centers of Jewish life are in Israel and Babylon. So Hillel comes from Babylon, and he arrives to Israel as already an accomplished scholar, and he goes to really deepen his Torah under the tutelage of Shemaiah and Aftalion. And he was someone who was dedication to Torah is uh, a superlative. Uh, he was exceptionally poor. He, had, he lived in, under grinding poverty. And the one story the Talmud tells us about, about this 
really shows us uh, a his poverty and b his commitment to Torah. And the way the Talmud frames it is also interesting. The Talmud says is that uh, in the future we're all going to have to give our accounting and reckoning before God, and everyone's going to have all the excuses in the world. And one guy's going to say, "I was so rich." I was so busy with all my investments and all my real estate, I, I couldn't study Torah. And then that's when I say, I was so poor, I couldn't feed my family. I had to do backbreaking labor. How could I study Torah? And the third guy is going to say, I was so handsome. And I was just consumed with my own desires. I, I couldn't study Torah. And the Talmud says is that each one of these people, they're going to bring a counterexample. Someone was more handsome, more rich, or more poor than you, and they still found time to study Torah. And it gives a great example where a great rabbi was so wealthy, so fabulously wealthy, yet he was a great Torah scholar. And I told us about Joseph. Joseph was very handsome and could have been consumed with his desires, yet he had a very robust spiritual life. And the example it gives for a poor person who was able to overcome this hamstring and but still become a great titan of Torah, he gives the example of Hillel. Well, ask the poor person, why didn't you study Torah? He said, well, I was, so, I was so poor and I was so consumed with trying to find, make a living. I'll tell him, were you any poorer than Hillel? And what's the story that he gives? He says that Hillel, he was, a, he was a wood chopper. And he would make a pittance every day from chopping wood. And he would take his income and divide it in half. Half it he would give to his wife, to his family to sustain himself. The other half he would use to pay to get into the house of scholarship. It used to be they had to pay the upkeep. So they would charge people, I don't know, a shekel to get in, right? Everyone puts in a quarter at the door. Everyone, everyone gives a nominal donation to cover the expenses. So Hillel, he would take, his, his expenses would be split down the middle. Half it would pay to get into the house of scholarship. Other half would be for his family, which shows you how poor he is. One time, he had a bad day at business and he had Nothing to pay to get into the to base matters to, to go study. And the bouncer, a guy who's in charge, says, Listen, sorry, you don't pay, you don't get in. That, that You didn't know who Hillel was. They just say, say, Listen, everyone comes in, gives a quarter, guy doesn't give a quarter, tell him to go get a, give a quarter. Hill comes, he doesn't have anything, he, he tries to plead his case, the guy says no. So what does he do? So he gets up and he climbs and he goes onto the skylight so he could hear. The words of Torah from Shmai and Aftalion. And that was Friday afternoon. And it was in the time of the winter. And it was starting to snow. And they're in there. What do they do? They study Torah the whole night. They have, they're, they're, they're extreme in their dedication to Torah study. It's Friday night. And they start. I don't know what time they start. But they're going through the whole night. And finally it's morning. And Shmai and Aftalion, they're there. They've been studying Torah the whole night. And Shmai said to Aftalion, my brother, every morning, the house, the, the house of scholarship, is totally bright. But now it's all cloudy. Maybe it's cloudy outside. So what do they do? They look up to the skylight and they see the silhouette of a man. And remember, it's Shabbos. So what are they are you allowed to do this in Shabbos? They climb up and they find him. He's under three amos of shellag of snow, which is a lot of snow. They, they quickly clear away the snow. And they wash him down, and they cover him with ointment, and they put him next to a fire. With all the things they don't now do on Shabbos. And the reason why they're allowed to do it is because it's a case of Pekuch Nefesh, life and death. And they said, finally, once they, once they rehabilitated him, they said, such a person who has such dedication to Torah study, that he's willing to go put his ear by the, by the window to listen, uh, even under such treacherous conditions, this is someone who's really worthy of us desecrating the Shabbos to save him. That's your introduction to Hillel. Under such poverty, under such conditions, uh, yet such commitment and zeal and tenacity for us, we'd say, listen, I don't have the money, maybe I'll come back on Sunday. Uh, but to him, like this is life and death for him, he goes and, and, and wants to, uh, to, to, to study Torah, uh, which shows us just a little bit of, of his character. Now, when Shema and Aftalia, they, they pass, a Hillel goes back to Babylon. And uh, he's going to return to Israel many years later. And the land was under the uh, despotic rule of Herod at the time. And he undertook a campaign to try to assassinate rabbis. The Talmud describes 
uh, it gives a list of several people who came from Babylon and brought back Torah to Israel. And it begins with Ezra. Ezra, of course, he came back to, he was the one who led the mission back to Israel uh, from Babylon. And he brought back Torah to Israel. And it says, Hillel, the Babylonian, he came and he brought back Torah and established it in Israel. He gives an example of three times in history, great leaders came from Babylon to Israel to bring back Torah. And the reason why is because of everything that happened uh, with, with Herod. So just a little bit of the backstory here. In the year uh, 63, I believe it was, uh, Pompey is brought in to navigate um, a dispute between two heirs to the Hasmonean throne. And because he was invited in, uh, and the Rome is about to reach its uh, peak, they just take control. And they start ruling it, as they always do, by proxy. So he hires uh, Antipater, who was an Idumi, who wasn't even Jewish necessarily. Uh, he becomes the, Rom- the Roman procurator of the land of Judea. And his son, uh, young Herod, he appoints him the governor of the Galilee in the year 47 before the Common Era. Herod is about 25 years old. And the Galilee is a little bit of a, of a flashpoint for extremism, for patriotism. And it always was during that, uh, during that time in history. And the people, you know, they've had now 100 years of Jewish rule, albeit problematic Jewish rule. The Hasmoneans weren't that great. But still, they were Jews. And now the Romans come. These uncircumcised pagans are coming now and they're taking control of the land. And there was all kinds of riots and rebellions that were mounted in the Galilee. And they would resist Roman rule. And they launched all these underground campaigns trying to unseat the Romans. And they refused to pay taxes. It was it was the hotbed of resistance. And now Herod comes, and he is now the, go- the governor of the Galilee. And he's going to make order. So he finds the leader of this movement. His name was Christio the Galilean. And he arrests him. And he arrests all his patriots with him. And without any trial, without any uh, nothing, he just executes them. And that's going to be a pattern through Herod's life. And Herod, of course, is uh, nominally Jewish. At least he thinks he's Jewish. And uh, the Romans have control, but uh, you know this is not this is not the way they, they even the Romans uh, behave. They turn to the Jewish High Court, which is still in session. There's still a Jewish infrastructure, and they say we're convening a special court and we're calling Herod to court. And Herod comes to court. And he dresses like a king. He's wearing these big flowing purple robes. And he has a whole garrison of soldiers with him. And he comes and says, okay, show me what you got. And no one's ever done that. You don't come to court like that. And all the leaders, all the heads of the Sanhedrin, they all put their heads down. I'm not starting up with this guy. I don't want to. And he was already a madman then. Herod was was renowned for his uh, barbaric cruelty from a very young age. And... The way it's described, in fact, uh, Josephus describes what happened over here. Every all the sages of the of the of the Sanhedrin are they scared to open their mouths? And there's one man there is not scared. His name is Shammai. And Shammai was fearless. We'll see this. We'll see when we we hit learn more about Shammai. We'll see this, this characteristic. And he gets up and he gives a speech. The way it is uh, told in Josephus is as follows: Members of the court and the king. Neither I nor you have ever seen an accused man appear before a court of law in such a manner. All the accused have come before the court have done so with trepidation and fear, dressed in black. But Herod, who was accused of mass murder and is summoned here as a major criminal, has come before us dressed in purple, his hair festively groomed and escorted by soldiers to threaten us with death if we were to convict him. I don't blame Herod. He wants to maintain his life rather than the law. I blame you, members of the court, you and the king, who have permitted him to behave this way. Know then that God is mighty, and there will come a day when this man, whom you wish to acquit, in order to find favor with him, he'll turn against you, and he'll punish you severely. So Shammai tells his colleagues, you cowards are scared of of Herod, and you want to curry favor with him? There's going to come a time where he's going to turn against you. That was his speech. In the end, Herod escapes. He goes to Damascus, and about 10 years later, his father is dead, and he is appointed the king of Judea 
by the Roman Senate. And his reign is marked by uh, terror and despotism. And like many dictators, he is notoriously paranoid. He's sure that everyone's a spy and everyone's trying to bring about his downfall. And he's ruthlessly stamping out any hint of rebellion. The whole Hasmonean dynasty, which seems to be a threat because they're the last line of uh, of kingdom, of monarchs amongst the nation, he kills them all. And one of them happens to be his wife. His wife Miriam, he wanted to bolster his claim, so he married her. But she's a Hasmonean, so he killed her. He killed his own kids. He wants to get rid of any hint of the Hasmoneans just to uh, deepen his claim to the throne and, and, and to remove any potential any potential dissidents. Herod undertakes a campaign to murder many rabbis. Uh, he's burning some of them alive. Uh, he even gouged out the eyes of another one. Talmud tells us a horrific story. He's gouging out eyes of other great rabbis. And many of the people who were sitting on the, on the previously, you know, decades prior, sitting on the Sanhedrin, judging him and uh, were too scared of, of calling him out, they themselves were subject to his evil and wickedness. Torah in Judea is, is under assault. The numbers of the rabbis have been greatly depleted. And who arrives back from Babylon? Hillel. Hillel arrives, and what he ends up doing is he replenishes the stock of the, the ranks of the Torah scholars. He's going to build ama- an amazing institution known as the House of Hillel, Beis Hillel, that's going to really infuse life and infuse Torah back into the nation. And there's an amazing story of how he was appointed the Nasi. Remember, he's a Babylonian. He's a direct descendant of King David, but he's not part of the family. After Shemai and Aftalion died, there was a family that became the family of the Nasi. They were known as the Bnei Becerra. And the story goes that uh, Hill comes back. Oh, there's been many, many assassinations of rabbis throughout the country. And it's the day before Pesach, and it's a Shabbos. And we know the day before Pesach, they bring the pastoral offering, the sacrifice. But it's Shabbos. So do you do it on Shabbos or not? The Talmud tells the story, there were so few rabbis in town, no one knew the answer. Herod assassinates all the rabbis, and a, a, a relatively uh, common situation it happens probably every couple of years, every 10 years or so. The day before Pesach arrives is a, is a Shabbos, and no one knows the answer. And everyone's frankly, what do we do? Do we make a Pesach offering or not? No, no one can seem to remember. And they, they, they remember, oh, this is a new guy who arrived in town who studied for many years under Shema and Italian. Let's go ask him. So they go to Hillel, and he's already a, he's advanced. He's already a, an advanced scholar and a sage. And they asked him. And he starts spouting these amazing proofs. And he proves it from all different kinds of angles. The Talmud describes what he does. And he proves it from this angle, from that angle. And they're like, wow, like, where did this guy come from? He came from Babylon. So right away, the people of the Bnei Becerra, who were the previously the, the Nasi, who were the, like, the titular heads of the nation, they say, we're abdicating our position and we want you to be the Nasi. And they stepped down from their post and Hillel right away was nominated. And he started teaching. He, for hours and hours, he's teaching everyone the laws of Pesach. This is about, a little bit before Pesach. And then he finishes his, his amazing lecture and was like, wow, by this new leader. And he starts speaking to the Bnei Becerra themselves, these, these, these previous Nazis who had just abdicated their position to him. And he starts criticizing them. He says, what caused you to lose your stature? Like, you woke up this morning and you were the Nazi and you voluntarily handed off your rule to me. Why? Why, why did this happen? He says, I spent 40 years studying by Shema and Aftalion and you didn't. And that's why I knew the answer, you didn't. And these Bnei Becerra, incidentally, the, the Talmud speaks about them very highly, even though they weren't great Torah scholars, but because they forfeited their position, their political prestige, to Hillel, because he was a great, greater Torah scholar than them, they voluntarily gave up their crown in this world, says the Talmud, and therefore they earned their crown in the next world. And Hillel became the Nasi, became the leader of the people, and for the next 400 years, Every successive Nasi, every successive leader of the people is going to be a direct descendant of Hillel. And the rest of the leaders that we're going to see in the first chapter of Perkavos are all going to be direct descendants of Hillel. For example, Rabbi Judah the Prince, who's going to be born about 130 years after Hillel dies, is going to be a direct descendant of Hillel. Son of a son of a son of a son. I think six generations. But all the intervening presidents of the people and those who go beyond 
uh, for the duration of the presidency of the Nasis of the, of, the, of, of, the, of the nation, it's going to be the right descendants of Hillel. And he begins to bolster the reigns of the rabbis. Such a great Torah scholar, and he starts attracting all the great minds uh, of the nation. And he builds a magnificent yeshiva, known as the, the base Hillel, the house of Hillel, uh, together with the base Shammai down, down the block. And the reason why, incidentally, the reason why Hillel and Shammai are not together, when, when Hillel himself is going to listen to the lecture, it's Shammai and Aftalion together. They're both giving the lecture together. The, the two leaders of the people are in the same room. And the reason why is because during the times of Shammai and Aftalion, there wasn't as much of a backlash against the rabbis. And therefore, all the previous Zugos were always together. Whereas now, Hillel is the Nasi, Shammai is the Afbeistin, but they split into two. There's the Beis Shammai and the Beis Hillel. The two houses of scholars, two yeshiva, two institutions are going to be split now because the rabbis have to go a little bit underground. They have to be a little bit low-key because Hera just finished the whole terror campaign against rabbis. They want to keep it hush-hush. Split them up, distribute the scholars in various different places. For the next about 100 years or so, there's going to be two competing houses, House of Shammai, House of Hillel, but progressively the power is going to go to the House of Hillel, and then after the temple is destroyed, uh, in the year 70, according to most opinions, for the next 20 years or so, all the arguments of the House of Hillel and Shammai, they're going to be brought back, brought back together, and everything's going to be clarified. And and they're going to try to reach halacha. What's the bottom line? Well, what's the halacha? Uh, and that's going to be like a convergence. So like the, there's going to be a little bit of a splintering, even though they were they were together still, but there was two schools of thought, and then it's going to be consolidated uh, over the next, uh, the 20 years after the temple is destroyed. Anyhow, so what is Hill's teaching? He's telling us to be students of Aaron, who love peace, who pursue peace, who love people and bring close to Torah. Whenever there was a dispute, Aaron would go to each side of the dispute and tell them, like, I, I spoke to your counterpart, to your uh, enemy, and he told me, he's like, ah, I just wish I could reconcile. I would tell it to each side. And each side would think, oh my gosh, they, they really want to reconcile. And then when they would meet, like, oh, how you doing? And they, they, they would all become become friends again. And uh, in fact, the Torah, actually, Rasha brings this down. The Torah stresses, if you look at the death of Aaron in the Book of Numbers versus the death of Moshe in the Book of Deuteronomy, the way it describes the mourning process for them is different. For Aaron, it says, Kol Beis Yisrael, the entire nation mourned. Men, women, because Aaron was man of peace. What, what his, his role was, Moshe was the leader. Moshe was one who taught Torah. Moshe was the one who was tough. He had to be the leader. Aaron was the one, he, was the, he played the role of peacemaker. And therefore, he was always involved in making sure that there's peace between husband and wife, between men and, and, and their co-worker and their colleagues. That's what he did. Now, there's an obvious question people maybe could ask is, if it's not true that Aaron spoke to someone's enemy and they never made this confession, obviously it doesn't happen, yet Aaron says it. So what's the justification for him lying or making up a non-truth in order to promote peace? So there's two answers given. One answer is that, yeah, generally speaking, peace trumps truth because truth is what's appropriate. That's what truth is. Truth is what is right. We see, e- even in Genesis, we see that God changes what literally happens. And God, of course, his signet is truth. Because that's what's truth. When Sarah, when she starts laughing at the fact she's going to have a baby, she says her husband's so old. Ah, he can't have any kids. He's so old. But when he, God repeats that to Abraham, God, sa- God changes it. God says, no, no, no. When, when, he changes the story that Sarah says, as if Sarah said about herself, I'm so old, how can I have any kids? And that's an example of God changing what actually happened to promote peace. But he's not been a wife. Now, is that necessarily going against truth? No, that that's truth. Truth is what's appropriate. Truth is what's correct. And in that instance, saying something that didn't literally happen is correct because it's what, it's what promotes peace. Uh, that said, I saw one of the other commentaries points out, so this is a little bit tricky. Because this to be this to be abused, he writes. He, he compares it to someone taking venom and using it as an antidote, as a remedy, as a medicine. Sometimes you have venom that could be used as, as a medicine. 
okay, but you have to be very, very careful at what you do with it. It's like, you know, we take the uh, maybe a modern example of this to be like, let's inject a little bit of, I don't know, mumps into a little baby so that way they're inoculated from mumps, uh, which is you have to be very careful how you do that. This can be messed up very quickly. So he says, yes, generally speaking, this is not for everyone. But for someone on the caliber of Aaron or what we're encouraged to be, try to become and be very be very careful with it, it would be appropriate under the right circumstances. So yes, uh, this is not necessarily counteracting truth. Now, the Rambam adds an interesting point here. He says not only is he bringing peace, but he's bringing them close to Torah. So how would Aaron bring people close to Torah? He says if Aaron would find about, about someone who was evil or he had bad behavior or he had sins, so what would Aaron do? How would Aaron bring someone – what was this peaceful method of bringing people close to Torah? He said Aaron would, would reach out to them in peace and would, would befriend them and would become close to them and would talk to them and speak to them and, and really deepen the relationship with them. And that person would be so ashamed because he's like, I can't believe it. If Aaron knew what's in my heart and how I'm really, I really am like, Aaron would be so embarrassed of me and Aaron would drop me like a hot potato. And he would look at me, Aaron, if he actually knew what was, what was within me. And, and look at Aaron treats me like I'm a such a righteous person. He, he talks to me like, like we're peers. I don't know what to do. I'm so, I'm so consumed with the guilt that I'm really not the person Aaron thinks I am. And therefore, I'm going to try to make myself as, as much of a person who is worthy of the friendship and the camaraderie of Aaron as possible. And that way, Aaron would use this uh, subterfuge to actually get a person themselves to change and to approach the proper behavior. I think, I think this could be applied even for us. Um, and I think, especially as parents, uh, we could really use this to our advantage. What Aaron is teaching us over here is, is that people aspire to be what other people consider them to be already, which is a very deep insight in, in, in human psychology. If you tell a child, you're such a bad kid, you always lie, right? You're telling them you're a liar. You're telling a child they're a liar. Okay, that they, they probably will be a liar. As opposed to, let's say you catch the kid in a lie. My parents used to always do this trick. I think it's very, I think it's brilliant. But I think what's what Aaron did. Kids don't realize how much smarter their parents are than them. They, they assume they could fool them like all the time. So the kid lies. The parents know the kids lie. So what do you do? Our instinct is to say to prove to them, like a like a, like a prosecutor would to a jury, to prove to them I can prove exactly, and I have evidence. I know that what Aaron here is doing is the opposite. He's not pointing out the flaws. He's pointing out the qualities that the person doesn't even have. He's saying, what, a, what an amazing guy. I want to befriend you. I want to talk to you. He's pointing out the stature and the behavior and the character the person does not actually have. But that causes the person to feel such guilt to actually achieve that. So what the parent ought to do when they find the kid lying is saying, I'm so happy you told me the truth. It means so much to me to know that I can rely on you. I, I really trust you with everything. And, and, and the kid feels, oh, I, I can't believe I did that to them. Like I... And they believe me, and they trust me, even though I did. And of course, you know, it's 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 all a game. It's not really a game, but it's yeah. it's a tactic. Maybe this may not may not work. But you tell the kid you're a liar. You're telling you're reinforcing what they actually are, and you're you're causing them to say, okay, they're a liar. You, they actually lied, and you told them they're a liar. So where is the motivation to change? Instead, what you do is you say, that's a I'm so happy you told me the truth. Our kids don't lie. Our children are honest, and I'm so relieved to know that my kids told me the truth. And thank you. And here's a candy for telling me the truth. Let's move on here. I have, I have some more things I want to I want to share here, and I have an amazing story. And Rabbi Yoda points out here that what what Hill is telling us to do here is not just to be a person of peace, to be a man of peace or a woman of peace. He's saying more than that. He's saying, he's saying to promote peace. Aaron, of course, himself was very peaceful, but he was going out of his way to make peace between other people as well. Which is something we're not accustomed to do. We, not my problem. It's that, that's the attitude that we have. But here we're being told, to, like the verse says in Psalms, right? Bake shalom brat fehu. Seek peace and pursue it. To try to bring peace into the world. And that's not easy because you have to kind of, you're trying to dance uh, uh, work on the fine line to not actually exacerbate the problem between two, two enemies. You have to be very careful in how, in how you do that. There's some more quick ideas here. It says here, you have to bring peace, love peace, and bring them close to Torah which is an interesting kind of juxtaposition. 
what's the connection between bringing peace and loving people and bringing them to Torah? And so the Ruach Chaim writes that even though you promote peace, you may think that, well, if I bring them to Torah, they might, they might cause strife. What happens? I'm going to bring someone to Torah and they'll say, oh my gosh, i got to buy kosher meat. Look how expensive it is. It, it's going to cost me 10 times the amount of money. And now uh, my, my, my budget's late, constrained as is. And what's going to be? All right, I'm going to get to fight my wife now because we don't have enough money. So someone might say, hmm, I'm a man of peace. I'm trying to promote peace, but I'm trying to bring people closer to the Torah. But those seem to be at odds. So what to do? So we, what, what the Ruach Haim tells us is that it's, it's an amazing insight here. You may think, or they may think erroneously, that coming close to Torah is going to cause them to go away from peace. So you can have one, one or the other, either peace or Torah. That's what people may think. You have to make a trade-off. Here what the Mishnah is telling us is not, it's not true. You have to love peace, pursue peace, love people, and bring them close to Torah. And all of these are possible because they're all really one and the same. Because the Torah, right, it's, it's, the, it's the will of God, the word of God, the ways of God, and that, of course, is the ultimate source of peace. And people may think that coming close to Torah is going to bring you away from peace, but it's not true. Another important insight. And also, it's interesting, it, doesn't, it, it says, it doesn't say teach them Torah, it says bring them near to Torah, which also shows us that you can't teach everyone Torah, necessarily. Someone has to learn Torah on their own. But we have to make Torah accessible to people. Bring them near to Torah. And whether they choose to embrace it or how much they choose to embrace it, of course, that's their decision. But our objective is following Hill's advice here, being a disciple of Aaron, is to bring them opportunities to be near to Torah, to bring them close, to give them opportunities at least to embrace Torah as much as they can. Incidentally, another interesting insight here is that what is the impetus for teaching people Torah? What does it say? Love people. And bring them close to Torah. The reason why we have to reach out to our brethren and try to teach them Torah is because we love them. And Torah is the best thing that they could possibly have in their lives. And we want to give it to them. And if, if that's the motivation, because you love people and you just want to help them, because Torah is amazing, and you want to just share it because you want to share with people that you like and you love, then your conveyance of that information will be effective. If someone says, I want to teach Torah because I want to give people rules, I'd love to make them miserable. And I can find ways, oh, you're doing this wrong, you're doing that wrong, you're doing that wrong. I'd love to point out all their flaws. Maybe you're teaching them Torah, but what it's telling us here, this should be predicated upon your love of people. You love them, and therefore you want their life to be better, and Torah will help their life be better. I want to, this story is an amazing story about someone who is really a promoter of peace. This is someone who our family has a very close connection to them. His name was Rabbi Moshe Menachem Jacobson, or Yaakovson in Hebrew. His father was the chief rabbi of Copenhagen and of Stockholm. And uh, his father was very close to my grandfather. My grandfather spent uh, the war years in Stockholm, in Sweden. And he worked hand-in-hand with Rabbi Jacobson in trying to rescue and save as many people as they could. And they together they founded uh, the school, the famous school in, in Sweden for Jewish refugees and in 1946, my grandfather moved to Israel. And in 1948, he opened up his yeshiva in the town of, of Beryakov, a small little town in the center of the country. So when he was populating his staff, he called this Rabbi Jacobson, who was the son of the chief rabbi of Copenhagen and Stockholm, his son, who was young at the time, and he became part of the staff of the yeshiva. And then he left the yeshiva and became the rabbi of the town. So in 1959, he became the rabbi of the town of Beryakov, and he was the rabbi of the town of Beryakov till his death in 2000, and then his son became his successor. The current rabbi of the town is his oldest son. My father grew up in this town, so he grew up with these people. He told me last night, I speak to him to verify the story, he told me that this was his role model. This person was such an amazing and inspiring person this is somebody he wanted to be like. Such personality, but such joy of life. Anyhow, so he had a grandchild, his daughter, his daughter Rivka, Rebecca. She had a child, and the child died in infancy. So there were two people in town who were enemies. They've been family feuds. They've been fighting for a long, long time. And 
Rabbi Jacobson decided to use this opportunity to bring peace. So he called person A, person B, I want you to come to the rabbi's house. The rabbi summons you to his house. So these two people, they meet at the door and they both see each other and like they're calling us together. You obviously doesn't know that we hate each other. So they knock on the door and the rabbi opens up and he's holding the dead child. Yeah. He's holding the dead grandchild. They're about to bury him. And he says to them, he says, this child, this child never did any sins. But he also never did any mitzvahs. So what's going to be his merit? He gets to heaven. What's going to be his merit? I want you two to make peace right now, right here and now. Make peace with each other. And that's to be the child's merit. And these two people made peace. They were, they were enemies for decades. And they made peace. And they, they, and, and they made peace because of this story. And I was thinking like, this is someone who, if you think about the tragedy, you know, in the face of tragedy, this is what someone's thinking of. Someone who's trying to promote peace, pursue a man of peace, a, a disciple of Aaron, this is what they would do. They, they, they found a way to use this tragedy and, and to bring peace and bring more light and bring more unity into the world. What an amazing story of someone who was able to promote peace uh, between two enemies, two committed enemies to each other. Unbelievable. May we uh, be uh, meritorious to also be uh, disciples of Aaron, people who love other people, bring close to Torah, who love peace, pursue peace, uh, even though, again, it's probably not going to be easy. Next week, we're going to continue with the next following two teachings of Hillel.